go with this as well as um, the smart board. All right, so we're going to look at um, the topic today of being checking accounts. And the one thing I want you to be sure that we understand when you leave today is the process that you go through to balance your checking account and also how to write and record checks the proper way. Okay, so if everybody just close your laptops for a couple minutes and follow along with me here, please. All right, so with checking, it's a little bit different today. So the question that I want to start out asking you is, what are some changes that have occurred in checking today compared to maybe your grandparents? Because I don't want to say your parents because they're not that old. But from your grandparents to where you're at today, what are some things that have changed in banking that would make checking accounts look different today than what they used to years ago? What's one thing? Online banking. Online banking has changed the way checking accounts work. Okay, you guys, some of you even told me that you go in and you look at online what your account balance is. Okay, it's, it's changed the way checking works. So the electronic part of that is totally different than what the old days used to have. All right, what's something else that's different today? And it goes along with the technology part of it. Yeah, debit cards. Debit cards. Okay, your grandparents didn't have debit cards. Your grandparents probably didn't have credit cards. If they had them, they probably didn't use them. All right? But debit cards have taken the place of check blanks. All right? Do you think that paper checks are going to exist forever? No. I think they're fading. They're starting to go away. All right? Now, there has to be some changes made before they're totally going to go away because there are some businesses that don't want to take debit cards. Because the banks charge them a fee to use a debit card. So if you swipe your card, did you know that? That places pay a fee to have you do that versus if you write a check, they won't charge you a fee. All right. And that's that's the, the reality of why some places only want cash or checks versus the debit card. Or if you're at Pennington, they have a minimum. You have to have a minimum of $5 before they'll accept the debit card. That's because they pay somewhere between a 2 and a 3% fee to the banks for the processing of a debit card transaction, even though it comes directly out of your account. Okay? So debit cards have changed the way, you know, businesses work. All right? How about anything else? The ATMs. Okay? The ability to get cash from an ATM. All right? So you walk up, you get cash, you, you withdraw it from your checking account or you withdraw it from a savings account has changed again a lot of the, the ways that, that banking operates. Okay? How about one other one? It's the movement of money. Direct deposit. Yeah, direct deposit. So when you guys get your paycheck, do you get a paper check or do you have an automatic deposit? How do you have an auto deposit? How many still get the paper check? Okay, paper checks are still out there. They're, they're kind of going away. All right, our school district has gone away from them. They've, they've told our employees, you don't have an option. You get auto deposit. I love it. It's absolutely perfect because I got caught one time. I thought I had gone to the bank and made the deposit when I actually didn't. It's when my wife worked for the bank. All right, so I had gone in, filled out the deposit ticket, signed my check. I'm talking to the teller. Uh, we get done talking. I walk out of the bank. The next day, I get a phone call from my wife. We're overdrawn. I said, it's impossible that we're overdrawn. I just deposited my check yesterday. She said, banks don't make mistakes. We are overdrawn. And I said, well, I've got the receipt. So I said, the bank did make a mistake. So I go to my checkbook, and I open it up, and there is my deposit slip with the check that I forgot to deposit. As I started talking, we forgot to make the transaction. So we were overdrawn. That was true. Okay? So direct deposit, that takes that right out of my hands. It's just, I don't ever have to worry about it. I know I'm going to go in on the 15th and I'm going to look at my account. Boom. There's my check deposited with what I have left over after I have my savings already withdrawn from that. Okay? So that's, that's been a, a real change in the way banks work. Okay? And I don't know that there are five. I just put five up here. But anybody, anything else you can think of? Those are the four common ones. You might say credit cards have impacted 
checking a little bit too, because now people sometimes have bills charged directly to their credit card and then they pay that off at the end of the month. Not so much, it's not such a great idea. We'll talk about that later. But that's, that's one thing that um, is a possible change to the way checking works, okay? The one thing I just wanna point out to you, if you do use a paper check, and once in a while we have to, um, <clears throat> for example, if you go up to the driver's license office up here, they still want paper checks. They'll, they'll allow you to use a card, but they're gonna charge you a percent in addition to what you owe them because they don't wanna pay the processing. So there's a lot of places that still want you to write that check. If you do, there's some things I want you to be aware of, okay? First of all, it's always a good idea to put your date in, but more important than that is right here. This says, pay in the order of. A check is a legal document that is called order paper, okay? So when this says pay to the order of, never leave it blank and never write it to cash. If you write it to cash, who has the right to present that check for payment? Anybody, okay? This says pay to the order of, and if you say cash, you have transformed this document from being order paper to bearer paper, which means anybody that bears it can present it, okay? Remember that, because you're gonna see that somewhere down the road, all right? Pay to the order of, put the name in, because if I leave it as cash, now it becomes bearer paper, and anybody that bears it has the right to present it for payment, okay? Also be careful when you write these numbers, 61 and 63 dollars, there's a space right here, okay? Normally there's a dollar sign here. I would always make sure that number is right on top of the dollar sign so somebody doesn't alter that, which could cause you an issue, all right? Now, if this number differs from this number, 61 and 63 one hundreds, which has precedence? Writing. Writing takes precedence over the written, okay? But I'm probably gonna tell you that in most cases when a bank sees that, they won't even process the check. But if the check is written out for 161.63 and it says 61 and 63 one hundredths here, the bank is only obligated to pay the $61.63, okay? I had this happen to me this summer. I had a guy seal coat my driveway and it's a guy from Bemidji. He's done my driveway, does it every five years. He's done it for as long as I've lived in my house, all right? <clears throat> and the guy's a teacher in Bemidji, and that's how I know him, all right? So he got done sealing my driveway, and we're standing out there talking, and it was really a hot day, and, and they had a, I went in and got him a bottle of Gatorade, and we're standing there drinking a Gatorade. So I go to write the check while I'm talking to him. I owed him $550. That's what it cost to do my driveway. So I wrote the check, $550, and then while we're talking, I'm talking as I'm writing out the amount. I wrote five and fifty one hundred dollars Okay? Five and fifty over one hundred, right here. Put the line, signed it, handed him the check. All right. Next day, I get a phone call. Hey, you do me a favor. Will you send me a new check? Because I took that check to the bank, and the bank won't cash it. Because how much are they obligated to cash it for if they do cash it? Five dollars and fifty cents. I owed him five hundred and fifty dollars. All right. So I said, yeah, that's probably not going to cover your material costs. So yeah, I'll send you a new check. So be careful when you do that, that you don't have a conflict because it can cause some problems. All right. Um, signature. So all of you guys are capable of writing your name like cursive, right? Okay. I had some seniors tell me, we don't know how to write cursive because you're always used to printing. My group last year, I bet I had 50% of them didn't know how to write their name literally did not know how to write their name in cursive because they're so used to printing everything. Well, this is a legal document. Don't write your name in printed form on a legal document. You need to sign it, okay? I don't care if it looks ugly. It should be a signature, all right? So you need to learn to write your name. So always sign it with your name. This memo area, if you want to use that, that's fine. I'm not real big on the memo areas. Um, this information on a check, this first set of numbers, that's going to be your bank routing number. This is your account number that also has the check number at the end of it. 
So those are some things to just be aware of. But be careful when you write the check to make sure that it's filled out correctly. Okay? Then after you write the check, make sure you record it in your check register. All right, how many are debit card users? Are we recording those debit card transactions in the check register? No. Say yes, we should. All right? This is important that you maintain that because otherwise you're not going to know where you're at. So a typical check register, you're going to have the uh, account number and then the date, okay? Or not account number, the check number and the date. Some will switch it around. Some will have the date first and the check number, all right? The transaction description, where you wrote the check. If it's a debit, that's a subtraction from your account. We're deducting that amount. If it's a credit, we're adding that money to your account. And then making sure that you're bringing your balance forward so that you're accurately identifying what your balance is after each check that you write. Um, and I know I was guilty of this. I used to I'd write a whole bunch of checks and I'd have one balance up here. And then you know at the end of the week, I'd add it all up and subtract whatever ones I wrote. Not a good idea. It's a good idea to keep it consistent all the way through your your register. That way you're going to know that you didn't make a mistake somewhere along the way. Okay? Okay, I want to take a few minutes to just talk about endorsements. All right? So when you guys go out on your own, how many bank with um, Wells Fargo Bank here in town? Okay, the one thing I like about Wells Fargo is they're national. They're all over the place. All right? So if you go to another, another city, if it's a larger city, or you go out of state, everybody has Wells Fargo Banks. So it's a national bank. All right, how many bank with like border state? Okay, how about northern state? All right, so those are privately owned companies. They're not as large corporation. They're not a publicly traded corporation like a Wells Fargo or a Bank America. All right, so if you leave the forever, possibility that you might stay with your existing bank, all right, until you get established or you're out on your own or whatever the case may be. So there's times when the way you endorse a check uh, might be a benefit to you. All right, there's two basic kinds of endorsements I want you to know because you're gonna need to use this in the practice set for tomorrow, all right? One of them is called a blank endorsement, all right? So you get a check made out to you in your name, all right? I get a check made out to me, I just sign my name on the back of the check. So I endorse it with my written signature. That's a blank endorsement, all right? When should you use a blank endorsement? And the answer is when you're ready to cash the check, okay? Don't endorse the check and then leave it laying around because you know what you've technically just done? You've really transformed this from order paper to bearer paper because it says pay to the order of, and now when I just signed it, you know what? I've just kind of made that like a cash instrument, okay? So you want to be careful in doing that. Only sign your check when you're right at the bank and you're ready to cash it or deposit it or do what you want with it, all right? How about if you are off at school or you're someplace and you get a check and you want to send it back home to be deposited in your account, okay? Should you use a blank endorsement and just sign it, put it in the mail and send it to your bank? I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. That's the time you want to use something called a restrictive endorsement. Okay, restrictive means we want something specifically done with it. So let's say you're off at school and it's a Thursday and you're not planning to come home for the weekend and you want to get this check in your account. So you're going to sign it, you're going to mail it home, all right, and you're going to use a restrictive endorsement. So a restrictive endorsement would be for deposit only, and if I know my account number, put that down, and then I would sign it with my name. All right? What's the only thing that can happen to that check? It can only be deposited. It's restricted to be deposited in this account. Okay? So let's say plans changed, and you know that you're going to come home on Friday, so you say, well, I'm not going to mail it. I'll just take it to the bank, and I'll deposit it. All right? So you come home, you go to the bank, and you're going out with friends that night, and you say, well, I need some cash. So instead of depositing this, I want to just have you give me the cash. What's the bank going to tell you? No. no. They can't because you've said for deposit only. Even if it's you standing there, the bank has to deposit the check. Okay? So let's say it's a check from your employer. All right? So you say, all right, 
then I'll deposit the check and I will take a withdrawal from my ATM from using my, my card, my debit card, okay? So you deposit the check, you take the withdrawal, all right? Is that gonna work? It might, depending on how much money you have in your account. But let's say you have $5 in your account and this check is for $200 and you wanna withdraw $100 from your account. No, it's not gonna work because this check has not been processed, so technically that money is not yet in your account. Does that make sense? So you might have to wait a day for this check to process until it is actually into your account, shows up before you can take the money out of it, all right? So knowing the situation here, be, be careful when using the, the restrictive endorsement, but that's the purpose of it, all right? It's gotta go in the account and it's gotta get credited to the account before you would be able to draw on it. And I know that can create a problem because I was standing in line one day at Wells Fargo and there was some guy from, I think it was from the rodeo, it was during the summer, um, like Thunder on Hoops or whatever, came in, made a deposit in the account, it was like for $2,000 and wanted to get $1,000 cash and had not, a, they didn't have $1,000 in their account. <laughs> they would have had the check cleared, but the check hadn't cleared yet. This guy was ticked because he couldn't get his money, but that's just the way it is, okay? So, just want you to be aware of, of how that works, all right? Now, special endorsement. Don't allow yourself to be involved in a special endorsement, all right? So, a special endorsement is a two-party check, okay? So, the way a two-party check works is, let's say that I owe you $100. So, I write the check out to you for $100. And let's say you owe a sibling of yours $100. So you take my check, you sign your name on the back of it, and you hand it to your sibling and say, here's the $100 that I owe you. All right? That's a two-party check. I gave it to you. You gave it to someone else. Okay? The problem with that is when that third person goes to cash the check, there are two people in the way. Me as the originator, you as the receiver, all right, and the bank is going to say, I don't know one or two of the people, and so we don't want to be involved in that kind of a transaction. All right, and it's not very often that that might happen, but if somebody owes you money, don't let them give you somebody else's check. Get a check directly from them or get cash. All right, so the way a two party check works is if I write the check to you and you're going to transfer it to someone else, you say, Pay to the order of, and you put that person's name, and then you sign your name. That makes it a legal two-party check, but banks don't like it, all right? So don't get into that situation. It's not very often that it might happen. These are two that you'll need to know for the practice set for tomorrow, but I want you just to know in the back of your mind, avoid a special endorsement like, like the one I just showed you, okay? Questions on any of those? All right, um, we are missing, Oop, here's the part I want. Reconciling your account, all right? So reconciling your account is something that we're gonna walk through and we're gonna do today. We're physically gonna reconcile a bank statement. So when you get your uh, bank statement in the mail at the end of the month, or you get your bank statement online at the end of the month, the balance that the bank says you have versus what you might have in your checkbook register probably will differ. They'll probably be different. And there's a reason for that. And there's a couple of them that are pretty common. Number one, one of the reasons is that maybe some of the checks that you've written haven't cleared the bank. Okay, That means that they're outstanding. They're outstanding in the hands of the public. All right, so anybody here ever have a check written to them and they just don't cash it, they just kind of sit on it for a while, okay? You are a person that drives someone crazy that wants to balance their checkbook to the penny every single month because they have to go and hunt for that check, all right? But that's an outstanding check. You may have had a deposit that hasn't been posted, all right? So let's say that you went into the bank right now today. Let's say you just walked up to Wells Fargo Bank and you deposited your paycheck today, 
right now at 2.15 p.m. And let's say that your cutoff date for your bank was today, the 13th of October, okay? Would that check that you just deposited show up on this bank statement that closes today? No, it would not. Because your check today is not going to get processed and posted until tomorrow, which would miss the cutoff of your bank statement. So that deposit, even though you have it in your checkbook, would not be posted on your bank statement. All right? So that's a deposit situation that, that could very well happen. All right? And the last one that's kind of a common is that you might have had fees charged that you didn't know about. And so the fees have been deducted from your bank account and are on your bank statement, but you haven't accounted for those in your individual checking account. So what we need to do is make sure that the bank statement balances with your account. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the bank statement balance. We're going to add the amounts of any deposits that might have been missed. We're going to total up the amount of the checks that were written that were outstanding. And we're going to adjust those so that our bank statement balance and our checkbook balance agree so that we're all on the same page. That's the process of reconciling your bank statement. Okay? So <clears throat> I'm going to give you a handout that will be three pages, all right? And I want you to keep the pages together. And we're going to walk through the process of reconciling an account for Renee Gibbons. Okay, so as I pass these out, I would suggest that um, you do this in pencil, just because it's easier. And they're a little hard to read, but I'll have them on the screen, so we'll be able to identify those numbers a little easier. Okay? So the three pages I just gave you, the first one is the check register. Now, there's a couple things on here that I don't like. All right? Well, if I write a check and I record it in my check register, I like using a single line entry. So I would do this a little different, okay, where it says the check number was 267, the date was 10-5. It's written to Mimi's, Mimi's Restaurant. I'm okay with that. Um, the amount is $13.90. I'm okay with that. Here's where I don't like it. Okay, here's my balance of 324.16, but then they record the check right here again. And then they subtract it to make the balance 310.26 with a note as to what it was on the line below it. For me, that's kind of clumsy. What I would do is I would take this note, I like putting it on the same line as my check, so a lunch, that's lunch, doesn't look very good, but it's lunch. 1390, and instead of having this, I would put this balance on this line. Okay? Same thing down here. For school book, uh, Minnesota school yearbook, I put yearbook here. Okay? I would cross this out, and I would put this balance up here. To me, it's just easier. You don't have to make that adjustment on yours for now. But in reality, I think it's cleaner if you have a single line entry. All right, it's kind of a, an accounting practice that is more acceptable and, and consistently used. All right, now the second page that you have is this one, and this is the bank statement. So that's the bank statement for Renee. How much does it say Renee has in her bank account? Ending balance. 385.26. I would circle that. Okay? I would circle that amount. Ethan, put that away, please. All right? So that's the amount that the bank says that she has. Now, if we go to her check register, how much does she think she has? She thinks that she has, whoops, this one, 138.76. Okay? So either way, it's not good. We don't agree. And if we don't agree, we've got to figure out why we don't agree. All right? The final page that I gave you is the reconciling form for her account. All right? So we're going to go through and we're going to do some reconciling to make this 
bank account balance. All right? So the first thing I want us to do is physically take the check register and set it right alongside the bank statement. And we're going to go through and we're going to identify what checks have been paid by the bank and which ones have not. Okay? So if you look on our bank statement, here are the checks that have cleared. And here are the deposits that have cleared. Okay? Now, when we go to her check register, we're physically going to go through here and we're going to compare these. And this column right here is where we're going to check those off if the bank has paid them. So we look at check number 267 on our bank statement for $13.90. Yep, the bank's paid that. So let's check that off. Put a check mark right in that, in that column. Okay, check number 268, that check has been cleared. Put a check mark to indicate that. Next one, check 270, that one is for $50, that is cleared. Let's check that one off. And then at the bottom it says that we have a service charge of $10, okay? Now, the bank has deducted that amount from our account, but we don't have that accounted for anywhere here on our check register. So I'm going to put that amount in right now because I'm here, all right? And I'll show you how I differentiated between the process of balancing the account and how I've accounted for that in, in just a minute. But let's pencil that in. So let's go November 9th, so we want to go 11-9. It's a service charge. It's for $10, all right? And now the, the balance is actually 128.76, okay? So now I know I've accounted for that service charge. Next, I wanna go to my clear deposits. And on the 20th, I had a deposit for $100, so that one's right here. So let's check that one off. And finally, we had a deposit on the 5th for $60. Let's go ahead and check that one off. All right? Now, when you look at your items, how many items don't have check marks? We have three. Yep, three items. So what I like to do just to highlight those, I like putting a circle right here to indicate that these three items didn't get paid by the bank. Those are outstanding checks. I wrote them, but Family Insurance hasn't cashed it yet. Bob's Mini Mart, they're still sitting on it. And Western Mutual, they still have a $100 check of mine, okay? So I need to account for those because those outstanding checks are making my balance with the bank disagree. All right? So once I've done that, now I'm going to go to my reconciling form. So let's go to the next form. And let's go through the process of reconciling Renee's bank account. Now, the first number up here, current checkbook balance. This was before we made that adjustment of $10, okay? That's what I showed before I started adjusting. So I'm going to put down 138.76 because that's what I had before I started messing with the $10 service charge. And I'll show you why in just a minute, okay? It's kind of six and one half dozen up here, all right? Next item on your, um, on your bank statement, it says, Add any interest or any other deposits not yet entered into the checkbook. Well, we didn't have any. So usually if you just leave a dash or just leave a, a zero there, that's fine. Subtotal of any um, additions, we didn't have any. So that remains a zero. And here's where we made the adjustment because there's a category that says subtract service charges or other deductions not yet entered into the checkbook. Well, we, we did enter those into the checkbook, all right? But I want to note that that's $10. 
So what we could have done has made this balance 128.76, and when we got to here, we could have put zero, okay? Either way is correct. But I wanted you to see if we did it without making adjustments to the checkbook. I like putting it in the checkbook as soon as I find it, so I don't forget about it. Does that make sense? So this $10 we've already accounted for, all right? But I want to make it a notation of it here because we're going to now make the adjustment where we have the subtotal of any deductions of being $10. And the adjusted checkbook balance now becomes the 128.76. Okay? And that does agree. That agrees with what our, our checkbook now says we have. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> then, <coughs> statement ending balance. <coughs> Okay, our statement ending balance, that's that number on your bank statement that we said was 385.26. So that's what the bank says that we have. So now we need to look at any deposits that were made that didn't show up on the bank statement. We didn't have any. We had two of them checked off, so we were good there. Subtotal of deposits, it's zero. Nothing changed. And then it comes to the part where we list and subtract outstanding checks and any withdrawals not shown on this statement. So there's where our three checks are going to be appearing. We want to list those individually. We had the check for $126.50. We had a check for $30. And we had a check for $100. So we would list those as individual checks. Then we would add those checks together. So the subtotal of outstanding checks is 256.50. Our next entry is our adjusted statement balance. And our adjusted statement balance, we're going to take this number and we're going to subtract from it this number, all right? And that's going to give us an adjusted balance of 128.76, which now agrees with our checkbook. So our checkbook register and our bank statement are now in balance. And we can say that those differences have been reconciled, all right? So that's a process we've got to go through every month. If you're going to do a good job of managing your checking account, that's what we have to do. And we get lazy because online banking allows us to go in and see what our balance is. But here's the problem with online. If I didn't look carefully, I wouldn't know that I had a $10 service charge. So the problem that that creates is, let's say that you, have, you think you have $138 in your account, and you write a check, for 135 or let's say you write it for 130 okay you only have 128 so now even though it's a two dollar difference you write the check the check isn't going to clear because you have insufficient funds so what will happen is your bank is going to charge you a 35 dollar overdraft fee and it's going to give you a nick on your credit rating so because you made a mistake of not balancing and not knowing exactly how much money you have in your account, you've now created a financial situation that you're paying out bank fees. Banks make millions of dollars a year on late payment fees, okay, and insufficient fund fees. So you want to be very, very careful that you know what the account balance is. And even though I wouldn't suggest you cut it that close to writing your checks, it's, it's still something that might happen, and people sometimes do. So don't allow yourself to be that vulnerable, that close, where a little mistake of a couple of dollars is going to cost you a whole bunch of dollars, you know, and, and a credit rating as well. All right? Questions on that? That's saying if we don't, even if we don't do checks on the third time, we'll do Yes. Why? Why? What do you mean, why? Well, I can go and look at every single Okay. Okay. So like I don't know, know. Check, then you won't have like checks that haven't been like offered yet. 
I don't have yeah, I don't yeah. have cash on my debit. Okay, so you have a debit card that comes immediately out of your account. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do you have an automatic withdrawal for your check that goes into your account? Yes. Okay. So there might be some time lags there. Now typically when you use your debit card, that typically is gonna go right through your account. It's pretty much instantaneous. Okay? Sometimes that doesn't happen. Once in a while you run into a day. Sometimes with, with some companies you might run into a two day delay. Yeah. Not very often. Yeah, not very often. So you're you're probably gonna be pretty close, but is all it takes is one minor little thing that you might miss. And that's why reconciling it is really, really important. If you never, ever write a paper check, I get it, okay? You'll, you'll be pretty close. But you know what? I thought I was pretty close when I had 128 and I wrote out the check for, you know, a couple of dollars difference that still came back to bite me, okay? Here's the other problem with debit cards, all right? I had my debit card compromised twice. Twice that I can think of. It might have been even more than that, all right? And the, the problem with the debit card is... Um, when you swipe that, all right, um, depending on the situation, there is a, um, there can be some transactions that are, I don't know if they're interrupted or if it's caused by technology or the company or whatever, but once in a while you'll have a transaction that will record the wrong amount, all right? So I use my card to buy gas in Rochester, and I went inside the station and swiped my card, all right, I think I had like $64 and some cents worth of gas, all right? Um, and it was with my, my truck, which has a fairly big gas tank, and gas was like $279, $289 at the time, all right? So I used my card. We were somewhere between St. Cloud and Little Falls. I got a phone call from Wells Fargo Bank, and they said, this is Wells Fargo Fraud Prevention. Did you use your card at Holiday Gas Station in Rochester um, to purchase a $1 item? And I said, no, I didn't. I said, I used it to buy $64 worth of gas. And they said, well, on your account, we just posted a $1 transaction. And when that happens, that is a red flag for fraud prevention. Because what people will do is they will get your credit card information, which is, you know, debit cards, same thing. They will run a small transaction through to see if the transaction processes. If it does, that's a signal that that is an active account. Then they will process another charge to come through, which will be a larger amount to steal money from your account. Okay? So I said, well, no, I, it was, that, I didn't buy a dollar's worth. I bought $64 worth. And they said, well, we think we should cancel your card. So I said, okay, cancel it. That's fine. We'll issue you a new debit card. Now, when you cancel your debit card, that's not a big deal. Because your checking account number is different than your debit card number. Okay? They're connected, they're joined, but the, the accounts are, are different. So canceling the debit card, getting a new one, not a big deal. All right? So I got home that, that night and I went online and sure enough, there was a $1 charge from Holiday Station, which I thought was really odd. The next morning I got up, I went and checked my account again, $64.25 and no $1 charge. So I called my bank and I said, how, how does this happen? And they said, well, it, it could have been like an errant charge that came through that it processed a dollar and then it processed the rest of the transaction afterwards. So it might've been somewhat of a computer glitch and then it came out to be the right amount. Technically, I wouldn't have had to cancel my card because the transaction was correct, okay? But I thought that was kind of a unique type of a situation, all right? How many of you pay at the pump when you buy gas? Stop it. Don't pay at the pump anymore. Okay? The problem with paying at the pump is that, maybe not in Thief River, but in larger cities, that's one of the number one ways that people are stealing credit card information. Thieves are putting devices on the pumps. It's called phishing. And what it does, the, the station owners don't even know what's happening. Thieves are doing it, but it will extract the data off your card when you slide it into the reader on the gas pump, okay? It will take your information. Now, when somebody gets your credit card information, they can use that wherever they want, okay? What about like one like key of the gas station? Inside? Like in the computer. Like at Senex? Like at Senex? 
Okay, so that card is directed to your personal account. I don't know how they have that set up. See, I don't know, I don't know if that's any different than using a credit card because I, I would think it would be the same thing. That but that's but that's a guess. So I honestly I don't know on that. But I never pay at the pump because of that possible type of fraud of stealing that information. I mean, there are literally apps that are made for your phones that if you walk by me and I have the app on my phone, it literally can steal the information off your credit card. Okay, those kinds of of um, of technologies exist. So you know, leaving your credit cards laying around or where you have them, where you use them, it's really kind of important that you protect that. Okay. Now the other situation I had with my credit card, uh, my debit card, was uh, about two or three years ago. I had um, in my financial management class. It was when um, Phil Anka was a senior. So how many years? Is that three? Three years ago, I think. All right. Four. Was it four? Yeah. Okay. I had those guys in my financial management class. in that third hour, right after lunch. It was during NCAA tournament time. So I had like four of the guys that played basketball. And North Carolina, I think, was playing that day. And so they said, can we watch the end of the North Carolina game? And I said, yeah, that's fine. I'll stream it. So I logged in to the NCAA site, and I got the game. Well, you could get 45 minutes of the game free. If it went beyond 45 minutes, you had to put in a credit card, and then it charged your account. It was like $2.95 or $4.95 or something. I don't know what it was. Um, if you went over that. So I said, big deal. Okay, fine. If it goes longer, then we'll just charge it to my credit card. I'm not going to worry about it. So I put in the credit card information. It was my debit card that I used, all right? Um, the game was over like in 30 minutes. And I told the guys, I said, once the game's over, then we're going to move on. We're going to get through our stuff today. So game, game ends. I quit out of the application. We went on about our daily business. The next day, I went in and I looked in my bank account, and I had a $1 charge. Okay, right away, red flag. And so I called my card company and I said, where is this $1 charge coming from? The name on the account, they looked up and they said, well, it appears to be an arcade company. And they said, what we think happened is somebody got your credit card information and they ran it through an arcade system and it said it was good because it gave them a dollar's worth of whatever. Okay, it was processed for a dollar. And they said, um, it looks to be a fraudulent transaction. I said, well, I used it on this NCAA site, but that isn't the name. And they said, well, I think we should cancel it. So I said, good idea. Cancel it. Send me a new debit card. All right? So the next day, next morning, went in and checked my bank account again. Guess what? $25 charge with the same company name. So I called my bank again. And I said, now I've got a $25 charge, same name. And I said, how can that happen if we cancel my card? And the lady said, that transaction came through between the time you and I were talking and the time we canceled the account. See that $1 charge came through, they knew it was good, so they sent another $25 charge through, all right? Now, for the average person, if you're not checking your card every single day, it's a smaller amount, that's the way these guys work. They don't wanna put in big amounts. They steal them from a lot of people and put in a lot of amounts because most people don't pay that close of attention to their car. All right? Had I not done that, once the bank has paid that out, it's tough to get it back. Okay? So that's why I think it's important for you to reconcile because when you have a lot of transactions, and you maybe don't use it a lot now, at my house during, um, during Christmas time of the year, uh, when we were writing checks, it was not uncommon for us to write. 100 to 125 checks in the month of December. Now, if I got to go through and figure out if every single one of those is accurate or not, um, that's more difficult to do if I'm not physically going through a checklist and checking them off. Okay. So even with a debit card, it's it's a good idea to balance it to make sure that your numbers match. And again, if you have a little fee in there for for something, a transaction fee or some kind of a of a charge that you're not aware of, you're just going to protect yourself from doing it. So I'd still suggest you do it. I know it's a pain in the butt, but it's still good money management practice. All right?
Now, here's the last thing. We're almost done. Been going a long time here. Anybody tell me what ready reserve is? Anybody heard of it? You have heard of it? Okay. You know what it is? Okay. Ready reserve is like insurance. All right. It's overdraft protection. Now, if Dave Ramsey were sitting here, he'd probably throw us on that because he doesn't want you to have ready reserve. He doesn't want you to have credit of any type. And what ready reserve is, it's kind of like credit. What ready reserve does is protects you from writing a check that you don't have the funds to cover. So let's say that I, I forgot about that $10 service charge. And so I thought I had $138 in my bank. I only had $128. And I wrote a check for 130. Okay, the check is insufficient funds. The bank's going to charge me $35 for a late fee. Plus, I'm going to get a credit made. If I have ready reserve, what the bank will do is they will give me a short-term loan to cover any check that doesn't have the funds available up to a certain amount of money. Okay, for students, they might give you a $200 line of credit. Or they might give you a $100 line of credit. It depends on the bank. Sometimes they'll give you a $300 line of credit. So if you go over the amount that your checkbook has, they will give you a loan for that amount. All right, they'll send you an email and tell you Ready Reserve just kicked in, which tells you then, all right, I need to pay this back. It's like borrowing money from a friend for a couple of days. That's what Ready Reserve does, okay? I have it on my account. My kids, I wanted them to have it on their account in case they made a mistake, that it wouldn't overdraft their account. Because if I have to pay interest, it's a small amount of interest. And if I have to pay interest for a day, minimal, pennies. But if I gotta pay a $35 service fee because I made a $2 mistake, that kind of bites you in the butt. So I, I think it's a good idea. You have to decide if it fits your financial need or not. Totally up to you, but I just want you to know it's there. So ask your bank, you know, or talk to your parents about it. See if they have it. Okay, and, and how they use it. The key is that if you go into Ready Reserve, you want to pay it off as quickly as you can. The bank doesn't care if you don't, they're just gonna charge you interest on it, all right? And it's, it's a, a substantial amount of interest, not as bad as a credit card, but it's still a substantial amount. It might be like today, it might be 9%, I don't know. I don't wanna pay anybody interest. So I don't wanna be doing it for a long period of time. So I just want you to know what that is, all right? So questions at all on anything we did here today? Okay, pretty basic, um, but that's just some, some general checking.